time frame when our guest speaker was running for the office of president of the United States, one of the things that was becoming popular was what are called voter guides. And I remember getting one, <coughs> getting several from that particular time. Got one, I think it was from church. Took it home and sorry to disappoint you, but you weren't in it. You were not, not on the voter guide. But there was a number on there for me to call and order, order them by the thousands. So I called them and I said, well, before you send me a thousand, can you send me one? I, I must not have got the full one. I only got the one with the R and the D's on it. I want the ones with the Constitution Party, Independent, Green, whatever. Oh, well, we don't have such a thing because those folks don't have a chance of not. So we get into the whole voting for the lesser of two evils things, which I'm not going to get into now. I think we did a presentation on that. I think we called it uh, the evil of two lesser devils. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we have a, a big job ahead of us, and here to help us tonight is uh, Mr. Mike Crook, and I'm going to introduce Jake from the Institute on the Constitution at this time to kick it off. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming tonight. First of all, did you all get one of these? Uh, cards here. We're going to be giving away some of our products at the back table there, so this will enter you into that, number one. And number two, it'll also keep you in the loop of everything the Institute on the Constitution is doing. How many of you have heard of the Institute on the Constitution? Fantastic. Amen. That is great. Great great to hear. Well, first of all, uh, when I first heard of Michael Anthony Peruca, I was just over 20 years old. I know I still look like it. Thank you. Thank you. He was running for president. This was in 2004. And I, like most 20-year-olds, had no knowledge of government. I had no knowledge of the biblical heritage we have in this nation. It's great to see you guys here, by the way. You're in your 20s, right? Somewhere's around there. That's awesome. I wasn't one of those. But here Michael Peruca was campaigning across the country with a platform of God, family, republic. When's the last time you heard that, right? And as he did that, needless to say, this was the first time that I have ever voted. I casted my vote because of hearing what this man had to say. And actually, you can a lot of what uh, Mike is going to share tonight is shared on a DVD set that we have right at our back table. And also, too, up against the walls, the four jurisdictions um, that Michael's going to be talking about tonight. And this is a DVD. We have these available. So if any of you don't get a chance to get everything and absorb everything in it tonight, you'll get a chance to share that back then. But this, led, this began a journey for me in my life to teach this Constitution course, the Institute on the Constitution, all across the nation. And I've done it to about a quarter of a million people now through radio. I became a radio show host. Uh, I spoke as a national speaker. And then also in the Institute on the Constitution, teaching these courses myself, which we actually have a packet here tonight. We like to train people. We don't want you to just get fat and listen to the message. You've got to go like Christ commanded us to do. We have a course packet that is set here that will literally instruct you with the DVD series that goes along to it. Some of you may have taught this already, but we can get you plugged into that. That's what I did. And as I did it, it was so fulfilling, and I'm not a standalone testimony to this either. There is countless instructors across the United States in all 50 states that are teaching the Constitution, not just learning it, teaching it. And each one of you can do that very easily. But Michael Peruca is a Christian. He's an attorney. I know. They're synonymous sometimes. Also, a statesman, a syndicated columnist, and a radio personality. Now, he's been seen on Fox News and all the major networks, but tonight he is your servant. And he's here to deliver a message that is revolutionary, and it will change this country. Christ promises that. He never promises defeat, only victory in his word. So would you please help me welcome Mr. Michael Anthony Cruz. never seen an attorney do this. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to the election day sermon in just a second, but I want to tell you a brief story. By the way, that gentleman standing up, st stay standing. You just started to sit down when I said you were standing there. That's my cousin Neil. Raise your hand, Neil. Just uh, say hi to Neil. Everybody say hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. 
couple of years ago, Neil called me one day, kind of in a tizzy. And he said, Michael, you've got to write a song. Give me one second. got to get a cake out here. Wait a minute. He said, Michael, you've got to write a song. And I said, about what? And he said, and he had read an article in the paper that really disturbed him, really shook him up. And I said, for the Lord's sake, what did you read? I said, I'll do whatever you want, but what did you read? And when he told me what he had read, I have to admit, it sent a, a chill down my spine. And I said, look, I'm your man. I'll write this song. I'll do my best because the people need to be warned. And so you might just consider this to be <coughs> your final warning. Humankind has survived some disasters for sure, like locusts and flash floods and flu. There's never a moment. We've been secure from the hills that the flesh is heir to. If it isn't a war, it's some gruesome disease. If it isn't disease, then it's war. And I'm sorry to tell you, my suffering friend, how the world's gonna take any more. You ready? In ten years we're gonna have one million lawyers, one million lawyers, one million lawyers. with dread when Attila the Hun, he conquered with fire and steel. And Genghis and Kubla and all of the Khans ground the groaning world under their heel. Disaster, disaster, so what else is new? We've conquered the worst and then some. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, my suffering friend, of the terrible scourge still to come. Help me out, I'll finish it then. In ten years we're gonna have one million lawyers. No, one million lawyers. No, one million lawyers. In ten years we're gonna have one million lawyers. How much can the poor nation stand? How much can the poor nation stand? about this and that, but they haven't gone back to the source of law and liberty and government. Where does the Bible say liberty is? Where the Spirit of the Lord is. Amen. There is liberty. That's where it begins. So I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. And let me repeat Thomas Paine one more time. A long habit of not thinking something to be wrong gives it a superficial, but it doesn't make it right, does it? But it gives it that appearance of being right. Now, don't we have a long history in America of things that are wrong, but have a superficial appearance of being right? Haven't we all grown up with Social Security? Of course, it's not authorized in God's law. It's not authorized in the Constitution. Haven't we all grown up with 
publicly funded education during our lifetime. There's nobody in this room that lived before the 1840s, I don't think. Um, but there was a time when we didn't have that in America, but now we have that. But we've all grown up with it. It's a very wrong thing. It's not authorized by the Constitution. It's not authorized by God's word. But we have this long habit of not thinking it to be wrong. And therefore, it has this superficial appearance of being right. Haven't we dealt? Now, this is the hundredth year of phony, fiat, fake money. We call dollars, but they're really, we probably call them Federal Reserve notes. Um, but they are fake, fiat, phony. But we've got 100 years now. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913. 100 years of this wrong thing that has a superficial appearance for the same reasons of being right. Now, we're going to give, I'm going to, I want to give you an election day sermon here, but I'm actually going to bring the author of the sermon before you, and he's going to give it to you. Um, but I want to set this up and talk to you a little bit about why this is so crucial. Why not only election day sermons are so important, but why you're not hearing them today. And what you can do about insisting on hearing them today. You know, people, Toby mentioned that I ran for office, and people, I was asked that question a lot of times, Mr. Peruca, why are you doing this when you don't have a chance? Um, and I always responded, um, that I didn't believe in chance. I believed in divine providence, like our founding fathers. That's what they talked about. As a matter of fact, when they stood up against the largest army in the world, the largest navy in the world, the largest force of in Great Britain, and they only had about 3% of the population that was on their side, did they have a chance? Well, they didn't rely on a chance. They said right in the document itself, they relied on divine providence, with a firm reliance on divine providence. Well, in that document, I want to talk a little bit about that document. And basically, what I want to do in the next couple of minutes is give you a little pray see, if you will, of what we teach in Institute on the Constitution, why it's important, and then introduce you to and give you an example of an election day sermon. Declaration of Independence is a very interesting document. I call it a document of complaint. Can I just ask? Uh, would you stand up with me here, John? Can I ask you two to stand up here? And would you come around here, Brad? I just need four people. Just would y'all stand here and face that way? Just stand right here and face that way. And I want to ask you, Brad, if you'll hold that page. Just hold it up in front of your chest. Here. And if you would, uh, you would all do the same thing. Thank you. Just face them out. Just that's it. Exactly. Now, what you're looking at is the Declaration of Independence right here. This is the Declaration of Independence spread out in whatever 18 point type so it fits on four pages. And I did it on four pages because I want to make a point to you. Look at the yellow pages. Fully three quarters of that document is nothing but a list of complaints. It's a list of 28 complaints against the king and against parliament. Right? It's a list of complaints. Now, let me ask you to consider this. If the king is the lawmaker, if he, if what comes out of the king's mouth is the law, he's the law giver, then what does it matter if you have 28 complaints, or 128 complaints, or 8,028 complaints? What is the difference if, in fact, the king is the lawgiver? It would, it would almost be like when mom tells you to go to bed at 9 o'clock, and you've got a whole bunch of reasons why you don't want to, but it doesn't matter because she's the lawgiver in that situation, right? And you're going to bed at 9. Okay, so what they did on this page, that Brad is, Brad, what they did on this page, he would have told me if that wasn't the right name. Um, and by the way, he did a great job playing the trumpet there. That was one of What they did on this page that Brad is holding is something that made the other pages meaningful. I would suggest to you, had it not been for what's said on the blue page, Brad's page, the rest of it would have been lost to history. It would have meant nothing. It's just a list of complaints. There's lists of complaints all over the place. You've got them yourself. But what they said here was very, very unique. You guys can sit down now. Let me just hold this, okay? Let me just put a hold on this, guys. What, uh, oh, here, okay. Um, what they said on the first page, on this blue page, <coughs> is extremely significant. Basically, what they said was the king is not the lawgiver. They said there's an authority above the king to which the king is answerable. 
He has to do this. He has to, he has to abide by this law, the little lawgiver. And what they set forth here, we call the American view. It's actually the presuppositions of American law and government. It's those things which they relied upon to say, well, we, can't, we have the right and the, and the obligation to free ourselves from Great Britain, and we, are, we can exist as free and independent states. And, and I said states, plural. Okay? So what did they say here? Well, you probably memorized it as a child because somebody told you it was important. And they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men have evolved equal, right? <laughs> Is that what they said? They said created equal. That's a very different thing. They said all men are created equal. So what do you need to presuppose? By the way, presupposition is just a big lawyer word. That means it's the given. The things that we're accepting is true before we can actually have the conversation or the argument or the discussion. That's all I mean by a presupposition. We already agree that these certain things are true. And they said we hold these truths. By the way, let's stop right there. What do you have to presuppose to say that we hold these truths to be self-evident? That there is such a thing as absolute truth. There is such a thing as truth. And that sounds pretty Straightforward, doesn't it? But do we live in that age today? Do we presuppose there's such a thing as absolute truth? A few years ago, I was at a fundraiser, um, and I, I was there talking. It was for a high school, and, and I was an invited guest. And one of the board members of the high school was uh, making the point to me and the lady that I was with was what, what, that uh, truth is relative. That there's there's relative thing. And I said, well, you mean there's a truth for you and a truth for her? And, for me? He said, yeah. I, I said, so there's no such thing as absolute truth? And he said, right. And I said, are you absolutely sure that's true? Do you, I mean, do you see the problem? Are you absolutely sure that the statement you just made is true? How could you be when there's no such thing as absolute truth? You see how it turns on itself? So to say that there's no such thing as truth is, makes anything else that you might venture to say nonsensical, right? So the very first presupposition of American law and government, this general presupposition, is that there is such a thing as truth. Then they went on to say that all men are created equal. What do you have to presuppose to make such a statement? Creator. That there's a creator. Otherwise, isn't the statement nonsensical? So the very first presupposition of American law and government is that there is a creator God. And then they went on to say that we're endowed by that creator with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and property. Uh, like learning pursuit of happiness. So, um, so here's the here's the here here it is, class. There is a God. Our rights come from Him. They're not privileges of government. And then the next thing they did was talk about the purpose of government. Now, somebody walks up your driveway, calls you on the phone. They're running for office. Somebody somebody knocks on your door. Or, sends you a letter or somehow contacts you and they want your vote or your money, whatever. And a very fair question to ask them is, what's the purpose of government? What's the purpose of government? Now it's such a straightforward question that could be a stumper because it's a pretty direct question. And most of them will give you an answer that sounds something like this. Well, we have to do for people what they can't do for themselves. <laughs> or we have to uh, uh, we have to build the infrastructure of the state, uh, or we have oh, and then some of them will say we have to take care of the children of the state, which I love. The state doesn't have any children. <laughs> children are given to moms and dads. The state's never even been pregnant, so far as anybody. <laughs> the state doesn't have any children. There's no children of the state. Okay, that just that's not, that's nonsense. Okay, so when you hear all these things that people say they're all, the, of what's the purpose of government, most of them will have some kind of socialist bent to them, some kind of humanist socialist bent. But take it back to what, what did Jefferson say? What did our founders say in this document? What did they say the purpose of government was? <laughs> to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So what's the purpose of government? To secure rights. What rights were the God-given rights? You just talked about the sentence before. Okay, so let's review. Here's the American view of law and government. There's a God, our rights come from him, the purpose of civil government is to protect God-given rights. That's it. 
They went on to say that if any government doesn't do this, you should alter or abolish it. They went on to say that, but fundamentally, it's one, two, three. There is a God, our rights come from him, the purpose of civil government is to protect and secure God-given rights. That's, that's the American view, okay? I, you could take biblical here and you could write American slash biblical view, because what I just described to you is the biblical view, in summary, is the biblical view of law and government. The American view is the biblical view. Pastor said a couple minutes ago that what they try to, what you're trying to do in bars is to teach Christians to think like Christians. Well, what we're trying to do is teach Americans to think like Americans, which is to think Christian. Same thing. Okay, we're trying to teach Americans to think like Americans again. And what makes you an American, by the way? Does your driver's license make you an American? Does, does some kind of card you carry in your wallet? Does your passport make you an American? Does your social security number make you an American? Or if you go back to our founders, what made them Americans is what they believe. What you believe, I would posit to you, is what makes you, truly makes you an American. Well, Americans believe this. They believe that there's a biblical view of government which says the state is divinely ordained. In the 20th chapter of Luke, when, the, when they came to try to trick the Lord, to trick the Savior, and of course, then who was, by the way, asking the question, trying to trick him? Lawyers. It was lawyers. And we're going to have many lawyers. We already have many. Okay, so it was lawyers, and they came and they, they said, should we pay taxes to Rome or not? And it was a trick question, because if he answers one way, he's in trouble, and he answers the other way, he's in trouble. Well, he doesn't answer it. that way. He answer, doesn't answer directly. He uses the question to establish a broader principle. And he says, show me the coin. Whose image? Caesar's image. Render to Caesar, therefore, the things that are Caesar's, but to God, the things that are God's. So when he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he's actually acknowledging out of the mouth of the Savior, he's acknowledged Caesar does have a jurisdiction. Caesar does have an authority, but that authority is limited. Caesar's not the Lord of everything. You render to Caesar what? The things that are Caesar's, but not everything. So, in the biblical model, model the, the civil government is divinely ordained, and it's limited. Over here in the pagan model, by the way, I said this is the American view, but I didn't say it was the only view, did I? There's other views, aren't there? And by the way, over here on this other view, you could call it Socialist, you could call it, you could call it communist, you could call it secular humanist. I call it pagan because it's not biblical. It's like if it's not A, then it's not A. There's A and not A, right? The law of non-contradiction. With me, there's A and there's not A. There's godly and there's other. Okay, so in the pagan view of government, the state is seen not as divinely ordained but as divine. They think they're God, and if the state is seen as God itself, by the way, they're going to take, they want to know where you are all the time. By the way, the real God does know where you are all the time. Um, they want to know what you're doing all the time. God does know that. They, they, they want to take care of you from womb to tomb, right? From cradle to grave. Don't worry about your health either. We'll take care of that for you. We've got that covered. It's going to be affordable too. Um, uh, so we're, we're going to take care of them. So, so in order to do that, our authority is unlimited because we're God, okay? So you see the contrast. In the biblical view, we're talking about civil government. There, it, there is a role for civil government, but it's limited. But in the pagan view, the government is seen as divine, the civil government. I'm using civil because there's other governments. I'm going to get to that in a second. But it's unlimited. Now, when, we, when the state does this right, when it pr protects the borders and administers the justice system so that we can live in peace and harmony and praise and worship the Lord, then we're patriotic because we see God's plan unfolding in our country and we love our country. But over here, we get all wrapped up in the flag or whatever and we say, my country right or wrong, which is like saying, my mother drunk or sober. Right? If my, I love my mother. But if my mother happens to be sober, it's my job to get her straight. I have a responsibility. My country is wrong. It's not my job to just worship whatever my country does. It's my job to get my country straight. This results in a republican form of government. This results in a tyranny. This is based on the idea that man is, that we are created. This is based on the idea that your great great granddaddy was some hunk of primordial ooze or whatever in some swamp somewhere. And your, and your granddaddy was some slimy thing that slithered up on a bank and maybe gruesome legs, 
and then your daddy was a monkey, and then what are you? Right? This is what they teach in government in, in, in government schools, by the way. They teach this. See, that's the American view, and this is taught in America, in quote unquote American schools. Right? So after they teach the kid that he's a mass of mutations and mistakes, then they try to teach him self-esteem, which I which I find incredible. But but that's but that's what they try to do, right? So we've contrasted this biblical American view. This is how this is the way we need to think. By the way, this view is contained not only in the Declaration of Independence, but in all the documents of our founding. This view is there. It's in the quotes of our founders. It's worth studying to, to understand and, be, and to become involved in our worldview. And I know, Mars, you, you, you do those, those things. You study those things. This evolutionary idea, and I never realized until I studied this, how much I myself fall into evolutionary thinking. I think we all do. And we, because we've been indoctrinated in this, in this idea, but it's very, very dangerous thinking. When we think about it in terms of law, we think, well, wait a minute, maybe something you did last week, which was perfectly lawful then, if the law evolves, well, maybe it's not lawful now. And maybe the law evolves to a point where we can punish you retroactively. So maybe something that you did perfectly legally last week or last month or last year, now you're, now you're in trouble for it. Isn't this a dangerous way to live? Is that you want to live under this system? Or you want to live under this system? So there's an American view. We contrast it with other views. And the biblical American view recognizes that there are jurisdictions. Now I want to talk about jurisdictions for just a minute before we begin the election sermon. Because it's, this is very, very important to understand. I've placed some signs on the walls here. I want you to imagine the four walls of this room. Let's just, for the sake of argument, imagine them all to be, we're in a square room and all the walls, are, all the walls meet in the corners. OK, when I point to the wall, just, let's just imagine the walls being meeting in the, in the corners, OK? Behind me, I've placed a sign up on this wall that says self. It's, it's on the stage. I don't know if you can see it. But let's consider this to be the self-government wall. God has ordained the government of the self. This is, by the way, what most of the Ten Commandments speak to. Thou shalt not do this. You shall honor God. This, this is commands and responsibilities that God has given to the person. It's, an, it's a personal government. We're supposed to exercise self-government. Okay. On this wall, I put, I, put, I put the word church. Let's think of that as the jurisdiction of the church. He's created church government. You've heard the spheres of government referred to by other speakers here this evening. This is what I'm talking about. Let's consider that wall to be the, the church wall. God has given the church the authority and the jurisdiction to preach the prophetic word of God and to preach it to the other walls. Okay? Over on this wall, we have the family. Consider this wall to be the family jurisdiction. God has given the family most of the jobs to do, as it was stated here tonight. Most of the jurisdiction, the raising children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, so the health, education, and welfare are, are to the extent that we're, they're not in the self-government, we're supposed to take care of ourselves. The family is the health, education, and welfare center. On the back wall, I put, the, you see back there, I put civil. What I mean there, that's the civil government. You've heard me talk about the purpose of civil government. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that wall back there. Now imagine, for a minute, that... Imagine for a second that God, if I could put this up on the ceiling, kind of. Imagine the authority of God coming down through each of the walls. Imagine a big arrow kind of moving down through that wall, moving down through that wall, and through those two walls, okay? The authority of God comes down through each wall. He's, he's not only the authority of the ceiling, but of the whole universe, okay? He's, he's the creator of all. His authority comes down... He has ordained each one of these governments. They are his governments. Okay? Now, probably the greatest, you have, you have that image in your mind, trying to, and th these jurisdictions have been given separate responsibility. And the job of one can't be usurped by the other. Okay? Sometimes they work in harmony. For example, the church can, the church is supposed to inform the family how to raise, how to raise the children, but it's not supposed to do the job, right? So, that, so sometimes these duties might overlap. But I, I make this, I want, want you to use this word picture not only because uh, to understand what I'm saying, but maybe this word picture might be helpful for you to explain to others. It might, you might find it handy. Um, probably the greatest lie ever perpetrated on the American people is 
the perverse notion of the separation of church and state. The very, the, the idea, the, it's a lie. It's a huge, huge lie with huge uh, consequences, okay? Now, Mark Twain used to say, a lie can get halfway around the room before the truth can get its boots on. Now, this, this lie has done so much damage. And I want you to consider, I want to ask you, what makes a lie a really good lie? And good is in air quotes here. What makes a lie a really great lie? Pardon me? Because, yes, he said it blends the truth. There's an element of truth in it. So it is with the lie of separation of church and state. Because in fact, there is a separation of church and state. And I bet you could point to where they're separated right now in our diagram, in our example. Mm -hmm. If there's the jurisdiction of the church and there's the jurisdiction of the state, point to me where their jurisdictions intersect and where, there's a, where they divide. Can you point to it? If, there's the, if that wall is the church and that wall is the state, where's the division between them? It's right there. Look, here's the church. Follow me. Here's the church. Here's the state. You see this corner here? Here's where the authority of the church ends and here's where the authority of the state is. So that corner is where it is. Right? That's, there's certain things that are on the church wall, certain things that are on the state wall, the state's supposed to protect the borders and administer the justice system according to God's law. The church is supposed to preach the word of God, administer the sacraments, okay? Do you want Hillary Clinton administering your sacraments? Right? Everybody, please say no. Yeah. 